On today's World Insight, countdown to U.S. President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration with big challenges, the pandemic and tanking economy awaiting his first days in office. How smooth could the transition of power be? And the pandemic has fundamentally altered the financial landscape. Insights from Ann Richards, the CEO of global investment firm Fidelity International, about what the new normal in investments looks like. So you've seen financial companies, technology companies in particular, do very well um, as the world has adapted the style of work. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. We start with a look at the latest on the U.S. transition of power. President-elect Joe Biden will sign a flurry of executive orders in his first days in the office to roll back some of Trump's controversial policies. They include repealing the travel ban of citizens from some majority Muslim countries to the U.S., rejoining the Paris Climate Change Accord, extending nationwide restrictions on eviction and foreclosures, and enacting a mask mandate on federal property. The move comes after Biden unveiled a 1.9 trillion U.S. dollars plan to revive the pandemic-hit U.S. The waning days of Trump's presidency, the sitting president and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo tried to lock in a tough approach to China before Biden takes office. With the challenges of a public health crisis, virus-ravaged economy, racial strife, and political polarization, how might Biden overcome all of these ideological divisions and get bipartisan support to push his legislative agenda through Congress? Let's loop in our panelists to find out. For the latest on the U.S. politics, joining us in Chicago, Laura Schwartz, a political commentator who worked at the White House during the Clinton era. In Iowa City, Timothy Hagel, a professor of political science at the University of Iowa. Last but not least, in Shanghai, Wu Xinbo, director at the Center for American Studies. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the program. Let me begin by asking our two American guests about the latest politics in Washington. It's changing day by day, probably hour by hour. Ms. <laughs> Schwartz, you experienced the earlier time of uh, impeachment uh, for President Clinton. How would you compare the circumstances then and now? Uh, what does that mean for the schedule, if there is going to be anyone, after the inauguration? Well, it's very interesting and such a smart question, Tian, because really, during the Clinton administration, that was an impeachment of President Clinton that we had to really see through every day and speak about the message and the policy for the American people while Capitol Hill did their work on the impeachment. Now, even though Joe Biden is not the one being impeached, he still is going to be under a cloud of impeachment. So with his rigorous schedule and his commitment to get so much done in the first 100 days of his presidency, he too has to see through the impeachment and speak, and I would suggest daily to the American people about what he's doing to stay true to the very platform of which he was elected to enact. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, Donald Trump himself will have to gather his legal team and because the impeachment has already passed in the House, meaning they brought the charges, and it will go on to the Senate soon. We don't know exactly when Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, will transmit those articles. But once they do, the Senate tries the president. And so he's going to have to present a defense as well. So Donald Trump is, is not going quietly off into the night. He's got a lot to do to prepare to fight this impeachment as well. How were the time uh, when you were in the White House uh, spending with the other members of the team to deal with an impeachment against the President Clinton? And of course, we know this is uncomparable uh, what is going on with that trial and what is going on likely with the content of the, uh, Donald Trump. But 
Uh, what was it like to be a member of the team that has been impeached? Well, we were determined, not knowing how long the Senate was going to take. And, I, and for President Clinton, I believe there were four or five articles of impeachment. And, and Professor Hagel may know that for sure. It was either four or five articles. So it was a longer trial. This is just one article of impeachment, mm -hmm. the uh, incitement of an insurrection. So it may be shorter in duration. But regardless, it can be just as harmful, like I said, for a Biden presidency trying to get things done as it would have been for a Trump presidency midterm. We all were pretty devastated when the House had the majority vote to impeach. Uh -huh. But it was because we followed President Clinton's lead, which was that every day he told us, listen, impeachment in the Senate's going to come and go. And they're going to be hard on me. They're going to say terrible things. But you know what? I'm going to need to work with every single one of them after this is over mm -hmm. because we've got this on the table. We've got education. We've got welfare. And that's how I think he got through it himself and how he really riled the rest of us to do it at as well, because there were very dark days when you're trying to get your message out and talk about what you're doing, but you can't even get to the front or the second page of the newspaper. And in this 24 hour news cycle, you want to do as much as what you can as, as the party that's getting snuffed out yeah. to just try to break through a little every day. That's what we did every day. We got up just with the goal of getting on the second or third page of the paper. Mm -hmm. And that's what Biden's team is going to have to do, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Hagel, your name is being mentioned by your colleagues, so let me come to you <laughs> about that. Uh, what do you, how do you compare the situation? And as a result, the timetable, possibly, of uh, the trial at the Senate. You know, it's so hard to tell. We are, this really is unprecedented, not only because it's a second impeachment, but because of the fact that Trump's going to be out of office. Some people have argued, in, including law professor Jonathan Turley, suggesting that Trump shouldn't even bother to put on a defense, basically suggesting that the point of impeachment is to remove somebody from office and he's no longer in office. So why should they bother even putting on a defense? Yeah. Now, I don't know if the, the Senate Republicans would try to put on a defense for him or whatever, or maybe they would simply try to say, well, it's a moot point. And so it's possible that if a trial goes forward, that Trump could then go to court and say, well, look, this isn't, isn't appropriate. Now, normally the courts won't touch an impeachment situation because it's a political question, but under this circumstance, it may be because it's a due process or not following uh, procedure properly that they would be willing to step in and basically say, okay, you can't be doing this. It's not just the Chuck Schumer and the Mitch McConnell, the current and the future a majority leader in the Senate, that have to agree with one another, but also members of the Senate they have to be on the same page, which means if they start a trial, they will have to be there every day uh, for the afternoon trial while in the morning dealing with the heavy agenda coming from the uh, new administration. So Professor Hagel, uh, do you think the political environment is ripe for that given the division? That's the other thing that's quite different from the 90s when Clinton was impeached. Again, even though things were very tense at that particular time, they're nothing like they are today, unfortunately. We're in an era of hyper-partisanship, and although there are some Republican members who would be willing to perhaps cross over, uh, maybe not on the impeachment, we'll have to see, although we certainly saw that in the House where some 10 members uh, did vote for impeachment. I'm not sure if any senators would as well. We'll have to wait and see if it comes to a vote. But senators like Romney, Sass, Collins, Murkowski, they're all ones that might be willing to work with uh, Democrats, especially yeah. on legislation of matters of one sort or another. And then we have to look and see, well, who's up for re-election in 2022? Who's from a, a state that's they're perhaps a swing state or a state where they might be vulnerable? Mm -hmm. And so there's uh, the politics, obviously, is going on aside from the particular partisanship of the impeachment. Mm. Professor Wu Xinbo from China, I know we are all observing this uh, from afar while the U.S. is going through this uh, uh, insurrection, inauguration, and impeachment. Uh, what is your take, uh, given the fact that you have been observing America uh, issues uh, in China for decades? Well, uh, this is a very uh, unique time uh, in my observation of the U.S. politics um, in the last several decades. 
uh, especially given the legacy uh, Trump uh, leaves. Uh, actually, this country is now in a political divide and antagonism, social chaos, and uh, strain. And most uh, uh, important of all is in a, is still in a serious public health crisis. Every day, you know, uh, thousands of people uh, died from COVID-19, largely because of the disastrous handling of the uh, challenge by the Trump administration. So this is really unprecedented uh, in the United States history, in its modern history. And also uh, um, think about the power transition. To some extent, um, Trump so far still has not um, considered uh, 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 his defeat yeah. and admitted uh, uh, the victory uh, uh, for Biden. So there's still uh, an uncertainty about what's going on on January 20th. And FBI has already warned that there may be uh, protests and violent protests uh, in all the 50 states on January 20th. If now, now from what we can see on TV in Washington DC, it's just like a kind of in a, in a war, war zone, it's a war situation. So that is really unprecedented. Mm -hmm. So that is a very challenging time for Biden administration and for America as well. We see the Biden administration is already having a huge uh, piles of cash, 1.9 trillion U.S. dollars to begin with, with the vaccination, economic recovery, and several other fronts. Meanwhile, uh, on the very first day of his uh, office, uh, right after inauguration, he might want to sign executive orders going back into WHO, you know, climate change, and issues like that. So, Ms. Schwartz, um, how, what, what is your assessment of the workload of this president, uh, given both what he needs to do and given the political atmosphere in Washington right now? Yeah, you know, Tian, you know, Professor Wu mentioned uh, just the amount of uh, collaboration, honestly, that has to come as a result of crisis. And when you look at that COVID relief package, that Biden put forward last week at $1.9 trillion. That's a big price tag. And inside of it is, is child care, it's job uh, assistance, it is uh, uh, helping people uh, stop from being evicted from their homes, it's a minimum wage, and it's getting vaccines into an arm, not just out to the states, yeah. but a national cohesive effort to help them get them into arms where it counts. I really think that that's where, and from what we've heard and from whom I've speak and spoken with inside the Biden transition, they've reached out to some of those senators uh, to talk about this in a bipartisan way. There's a lot in that $1.9 trillion that both Republicans and Democrats alike have spoken about, including adding an additional $1,400 of assistance uh, that would make it to that 2000 that President Trump himself was calling for mm -hmm. at the end of the year. So, so I think it's finding collaboration where you can, and certainly when it comes to the pandemic and the economy, that, that can be done by consensus. A lot of hard work, but it can. And then executive orders, as you mentioned, rejoining the World Health Organization, the Paris Climate Accord, um, turning back the ban on Muslims, there are things that he can do by executive order that will be swift and will follow through on campaign promises. So you're going to see a, a pretty good balance of, of both. Yeah. But you've got to have a bipartisan consensus, especially in 100 days, to prove to the American people, listen, this is what I said I would do. This is what the 81 million Americans voted for me to do. And I'm going to do it. Given someone who have served in the administration, what do you think might be the best way for this administration to approach both parties? You find your allies across the aisle. You know, as Professor Hagel said earlier, and, and, and we've been echoing, the Senate is a bit more measured uh, from the conservative Republican, not the Trumpian Republican, but the more conservative Republican base. And, and that's where Joe Biden is familiar and that's where Joe Biden has to reach so that if he has an event in the Rose Garden at the White House, and I hope he does on the second day of the administration, mm -hmm. it shouldn't just be surrounded by Democrats. He's got to bring in a Republican forever. When I was the White House director of events, I had a rule. 
if we were going to have a Democratic member of the Senate, we needed to have a Republican as well. Oh, you because go. you have to show mm -hmm. a collaboration. Now, some days it's harder than others. But I really hope they do make that a priority of theirs. That's how you get things done. Professor Hagel, though, if you look at what's going on in the countries, not just the, what Washington is doing, but also the localities, you see different uh, states also divided, as we have already witnessed. And there are those uh, who are coming out and uh, trying to accuse uh, those who have not voted yes for uh, Trump impeachment. So how do you see that bringing together the consensus that Laura mentioned possible? Well, as she indicated, and it's a very good point, is you have to seek your allies or find where you can find some common ground with certain people who maybe aren't utterly opposed to whatever your policies are. And that's where the, if, even though there are going to be Republicans who maybe aren't real s strong in favor of Trump, are a little concerned about the price tag of $1.9 trillion and have been concerned about the price of a lot of things in the Trump administration, maybe are now going to put their foot down, so to speak. But what you have to look at are things that I usually refer to as the kitchen table issues. Mm -hmm. Try to forget about or not emphasize the partisan politics that are going on, because a lot of people, especially people in the middle, the independents, they don't care about that stuff. They aren't paying attention to that stuff. And in fact, it turns them off to mm -hmm. a great extent. What they do care about, particularly in the environment we're in now, is the economy, how we're dealing with not only the pandemic, but the economic fallout from the pandemic. And so they need that help. Those businesses, small businesses need that help. Uh, individuals need an extra $1,400. And maybe some will argue that that's not enough, but at least it's something to get them through another month or another few weeks. Right. On the other hand, the Republican Party, isn't it, uh, Professor Hagel, also have to come to consensus, uh, given what Trump did within the Republican Party. How much difficulty do you see that the party itself needs to come to realize what they need to do next? My guess is he's not going to just quietly fade away like most presidents do. Um, Obama basically did. George W. Bush basically did. Carter did a lot of public service sorts of things. But you know, these presidents really didn't get involved in politics too much after they left office. With Trump, he's a fighter. He's unhappy with the result. He's a media guy. He always was. He was before he ran for office. And so yeah. it's very possible that he's going to try to stay in the spotlight. And it's very possible that people want him to stay in the spotlight because he is such a divisive figure and he gets a lot of media attention. If that's the case, then those divisions within the Republican Party are going to continue, making it more difficult for them to find some issues to coalesce around. They might be able to do it, especially, again, on the economic side of things and dealing with the pandemic and the economy right. but you know if it's the political stuff they're going to remain divided and that's going to be good news for democrats in the next two and four year elections interesting once the president elect becomes the president uh, a lot of corrections can be done about the wrong directions of foreign policy international approach by washington right now uh, professor wu how realistic and pragmatic uh, do you think uh, those hopes uh, uh, could be from this part of the world? I think the general expectation um, is that uh, Biden will first and foremost try to reach out to allies and friends uh, so that to consolidate the um, uh, U.S. Um, position in the world and, and regain the influence it has lost during the uh, Trump years. So I think that is something on the um, high agenda and uh, a priority uh, for Trump's, uh, for Biden's uh, foreign policy agenda. And also we are going to see uh, Biden to get back to some of the international mechanisms uh, that Trump decided to work out, uh, especially Paris Agreement. And also it's likely the U.S. is going to return to the uh, Iran nuclear deal and we are, um, stop the process of creating a World Health Organization. Uh, I think this is a uh, 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 the priority uh, for Biden's foreign policy and it's going to happen. And also I think his team will need some internal um, examination about the legacy of Trump's China policy. Just say how much damages uh, Trump has done to China-US relationship. Huge challenges for Biden. 
even during the last few days of this administration, we see some administration officials trying to lay down one hurdle after another for the next administration coming in <laughs> to improve any kinds of relationship with China. Uh, now, Professor Wu, uh, did China understand this? And how will China work with positive messages, if there were any, coming from the new administration at the very beginning of uh, their term in the White House? Well, I think this kind of um, um, barriers that Trump administration uh, has been trying to build up in the um, last days of the administration is not just politically driven. Uh, I think sometimes it's also psychologically driven. Mm -hmm. uh, some people, including uh, uh, Pompeo, I, I think they really hate China. So they <laughs> just want to uh, um, express the, the anger and to some extent frustration uh, with China by taking this uh, kind of crazy actions. I think Biden, uh, on the one hand, he needs to talk about China as a major uh, competitor to the United States and appears to be tough on, on China. But on the other hand, he understands the necessity of uh, working with China, a uh, wide, wide range of issues of his concern, mm -hmm. a wide range of issues of US interests. So um, he may need some time to figure out the uh, agenda, but I think China certainly has some expectation that um, under Biden administration, there will be more opportunities and room for cooperation. Mm -hmm. And finally, before we go, there's another issue about whether a president will be able to pardon himself. That is a huge debate inside the U.S. politics right now. Ms. Schwartz, how do you see that? And what do you make of the uh, consistent uh, effort by the current president to do so? Well, you know, President Trump has certainly wondered about a pardon for himself, not just with his advisories, but out loud. And it's something that constitutional scholars have been debating. They can look back to different rulings or readings and writings to say, listen, one cannot be the jury of themselves and that the pardon privilege would not extend to the president himself. Now, it looks like there's a couple of advocates surrounding the president saying, yes, you can do it, sir, you should go ahead. But the majority around him say, listen, you try to pardon yourself, you're going to look more guilty, mm -hmm. especially going into an impeachment proceeding, and you're going to be challenged by the courts. Do you really want that? So I think it's getting less likely. I, I, I have to tell you, Tian, maybe about two, three weeks ago, before the insurgents in the Capitol, I would have said it was 80% likely Trump would try to pardon himself and probably be able to do it. Now I think that's more 20 to 30% at this point. Interesting. Professor Hegel, what is the process for a president to pardon himself before he leaves office? And what does you make about that possibility for Trump? Well, I don't know that we know what the process would be other than how we would pardon anybody else and mm -hmm. basically say, okay, you know, any crimes, federal crimes you were had committed that you cannot be charged with. And essentially, President Ford did as much for President Nixon. I would say, though, that a couple of things. First, it's not clear that, at least at a federal level, that Trump's broken any laws. People talk about the incitement to riot and so forth, but what he said at that particular event doesn't seem to satisfy the advocacy of violation of the law uh, criteria of immediacy and likelihood. So it may be that he really doesn't need to. He also can't pardon himself for any potential state crimes. And we know that the attorney general of the state of New York is looking into Trump's financial dealings. And so that's something he, he can't do as president, pardon himself for that. I would also say that if in fact there is any federal crimes that are committed, it might be a good idea, and a few people have mentioned this, for Biden to simply pardon the president, just to get it out of, this, out of his hair, out of the way, and so forth. Now, again, that may not work because Trump is Trump, but still, it would help to soften, perhaps, a lot of people if we don't have to go through some sort of trial of an ex-president, yeah. which would then be, again, a media circus taking away from the Biden administration. What an interesting situation. Uh, unprecedented, I would say, and certainly, <laughs> With your help and your insights, we understand it much better. Thank you so much, the three of you, Laura Schwartz, Tim C. Hagel, and Wu Xinbo. 
and you're watching World Insights still to come on our program today. The pandemic has fundamentally altered the financial landscape. We speak to Anne Richards, CEO of global investment firm Fidelity International, about what the new normal in investments looks like. So you've seen financial companies, technology companies in particular, do very well um, as the world has adapted the style of work. It's World Inside, I'm Tian Wei. Next, we take a glimpse at the global economy amid the pandemic. Despite the grave and complex environment, China has shown steady economic recovery. The National Bureau of Statistics said on Monday that the country's GDP grew by 2.3 percent for the year 2020. It's reported to be the only major economy to grow last year as the pandemic suspends travels and many other sectors. Meanwhile, worldwide, the major investment banks and internet-related industries are reported to be doing well in the third and fourth quarter of last year. So how do investors look at the current economic reality for the year 2021? For that, I spoke to Anne Richards, CEO of global investment firm Fidelity International, who has been instrumental over the years in building gender equity in the business world. Take a listen. And what a pleasure seeing you here. Um, it's lovely to be back speaking with you again. So thank you for inviting me. I've been looking forward to this interview for quite some time. How you been? I mean, it's been a very strange year. That we, uh, it's almost a year now that we've been working in this virtual world. But, uh, you know, we've managed to weather the storm, I think. And hopefully we're seeing some signs of progress beginning to come through in 2021. We hope that will be the case. The good thing is uh, some economies are still growing. For example, that of China, the number of China's GDP just came out more than 100 trillion yuan for the year 2020, growth rate about 3.4. What do you make of that? Well, look, it's, it's, it's a great result on the part of China, and it really shows the resilience of the Chinese economy. Of course, China led us into the crisis in a way because it was one of the first to be hurt by hit by the virus when it came through, but there were very, very strong measures put in. Also, the support packages that went in to help support business. And you've started to see that coming through with a very positive fourth quarter number. And I think what we hope is that that is the pattern that we will see in other global economies as they begin to come through this pandemic as well as we go through 2021. Mm. Looking at China's number, what does it mean to you, both your business and also your company? So I think you know, China plays such a hugely important part in the global economy that that it directly or indirectly it has a has an impact on all businesses pretty much because of that importance within the supply chain as much as anything else. For us as a business, I mean, our, we've been present in China for more than fifteen years now. Um, it, China remains a very important part of our long-term strategy. We are a business that tries to help people save for their future. We want to be part of deepening those capital markets in China. And so the fact that China has proven to be resilient, I think is good for our investors. And it's also hopefully good for the development of our business in China as we go through 2021. You said earlier in 2000, in fact, uh, you were saying that your staff will not be able to come back to the office uh, for the normal days uh, unless it is reaching the end of 2021. Wow, what you have just predicted seemed to uh, really has become the picture. Tell me more about your latest assessment about what's likely to be the so-called going back to normalcy, depending on the degrees of normalcy, and what is your assessment of the latest situation? Okay, look, so when I, I think when I said that <clears throat> back in May of last year, it was in the context that there were some people were much more optimistic that we might return to a quote normality at some point earlier in 2020 and i just couldn't see that was really likely given the unusual situation that we're in i think as we go through 2021 it has been interesting that uh, locations vary quite a lot around the world for us we've seen different patterns in different countries and we've seen some which have managed a very uh, great deal of viral containment actually to go back to pretty close to where we were before. I think the pattern through 2021 is still going to be a little bit stop start location by location. The most important thing for 2021, though, is the vaccine rollout, which is immensely positive. 
What you are also seeing, though, is even though I think the wider economic effects will gradually work their way through and we'll see a resumption of more normal societal activity, I think people want something quite different from their workplace. And that's what 2020 showed us. So although I think we will be returning to a more normal societal environment, I think the workplace has probably changed quite a lot and we're still working through what that means. So more working from home, more flexibility. Those are the things that our employees and you can see, generally speaking, business employees are asking for and we need to work through what that means. So I think, you know, more optimism as we go through 2021 and a new normal. I am right now looking at you and also the beautiful flowers you have in the background. I heard uh, that's coming from your husband. <laughs> That was that was a present for my husband at the weekend. So this year we'll have been married for 30 years, 30 years. Wow, congratulations, yeah, Anne. That. Wow, that's a great testimony of it. But you know, working at home with that beautiful flower, certainly it's a, it's, it's a wonderful feeling, but uh, how are people likely to adjust, you know, to this change of lifestyle and working style? That's gonna be a big question, isn't it? And how is it going to impact on the performances of companies? Gosh, it's such, it is such a change. I mean, and I'm, I was never somebody who wanted to work from home. I thought she enjoyed working from home. So mm -hmm. I had to go through a massive adjustment. I mean, I really do still miss traveling. I mean, I, I miss visiting <laughs> yeah. different locations, meeting people face to face, you know, like we did um, when we met. You know, it, it's I, I do yeah. miss that. I miss my teams. On the other hand, it's given people more flexibility. Many of our staff have really long commutes. So being able to give them that time back to do different things in the day, I think is a positive. So I think focusing on that positive, trying to keep the good new things that we've learned about the working environment over the last 12 months, I think that's really important, not just going back into old bad habits, but nonetheless going back into more human contact, more ability to travel, and experience different cultures and different ways of doing business and learning from it. I think that's what we're keen to keen to go back to. And some suggest that we are at a crossroad. Probably there are more opportunities for the year 2021, not just about the solutions of a vaccine for the pandemic, but also a geopolitically and also in terms of trade, in terms of business environment. As we know, we suffered quite a few years of setbacks in all of those areas. What is your assessment? I think that there, there has been a little bit of a trend back to thinking first and foremost about national interests in many countries um, around the world. And I, and I think you saw that in the slowdown in global tra trade, which mm -hmm. of course the, the pandemic has made, um, has exacerbated in a way. I think what's also begun to emerge is the, the, the negative consequences of that. So I hope that with this renewed sense of collaboration, um, which we've seen with vaccine development, I think with that new sense of sort of coming together as societies, that perhaps that will allow us to do a little bit of a reassessment on some of those geopolitics to allow us to move forward in, in a spirit of collaboration with our international partners you know, in all regions and, and around the world. And, and I, I, th I think that renewed sense of global purpose and the, the fact that to have an effective response to the COVID pandemic, it required international cooperation. And it reminded us of the real benefit of that international cooperation. And I think we need to remember that and build and work on that as we go through, through 2021. Well said. Uh, having talked about uh, some of the general situation, let me ask more about some of the issues you are extremely and passionate about, for example, about gender equity. Uh, some suggest as the economy is slowing down in such a way, unemployment is going skyrocketing as a result of the pandemic and many other factors. So these issues about gender equity, about racial issues might be sidelined rather than being focused on what's your assessment once again? So I think, I think we, are, we, we need to be very careful. So on the positive side, one of the things that we saw is that companies which we rated more highly in general on sustainability, on environmental, social and governance um, measures through 2021 actually outperformed. So you saw very strong financial performance from companies that we rated better on many of those metrics. 
However, on the other side, and less positively, we've also seen that some of the pressure that has come through um, in response to the pandemic has fallen disproportionately, particularly on women and, and on a number of um, yeah. minority or um, underrepresented groups as well. And that is, I think, really problematic because you've seen elements of inequality exacerbated through 2020 at the same time as you've seen companies with more sustainable, more resilient business models actually do better. The most recent jobs data from the US is one interesting data point in that. If you look at December just as one month, and one shouldn't overextend that, but of the job losses in December, all of them and more on a net basis were from women. So women have disproportionately lost their jobs through this crisis in December. So I think we need to be really alive to the fact that um, in, in 2021, we need to make sure that those unintended inequalities which emerged through, through 2020, that we work hard to redress them as we move back into a more um, cyclical recovery post the pandemic that we've experienced. And I think it is really important that governments and companies together really focus on this to try and make sure that inadvertently we don't take a step backward on the journey towards gender equality. I think it's really important. The other thing I want to ask you, Anne, is uh, earlier you said in an interview that everything is becoming microeconomic. Would you like to explain what you exactly meant? Yes. So the the when I grew up in the investing world, um, in particular, fixed income markets were macro led. And what I mean by that is we would look at what the fixed income markets, what the bond markets were telling us. We would look at the bond markets to get an assessment of what future expectations were on inflation, what future expectations were on economic growth. With, and this has been an increasing trend, I think, but with the advent of unconventional monetary policy, with the advent of QE, and we saw this once again in March when the central banks moved with coordination to inject liquidity in the, into the market, essentially the shape of the yield curve is no longer something which tells you what future inflation expectations might be or what future growth expectations might be. First and foremost, the shape of the yield curve is increasingly determined by the central banks, by their buying and selling activity. And that's what I meant mm -hmm. by talking about it being micro. Really, it is about the balance of the demand and supply that the central banks themselves are providing which may be led by a macro view, but quite often is being led by different things, liquidity, solvency, that the global economy keeps functioning. And I think that's quite a difference. So that's really what I meant. It's about buying and selling at a central bank level, turning what used to be a macro series of events into something which looks much more like microeconomics. Are you confident about the central bank's uh, decision-making processes, particularly in the time when the pandemic has exacerbated all the economic difficulties. And, and we also see currencies in various countries that have been moving ups and down quite dramatically, not to mention it's going to be a very difficult uh, economic recovery at time, even though we could get through this pandemic uh, somewhat. Well, I think what you've seen that the, in, in 2020 is that we've pretty much reached the limits of monetary policy. And yeah. you know, the era of the independent central, central bankers effectively operating you know, with a great deal of independence from fiscal policy, I think there has been a growing realization that monetary policy and fiscal policy, particularly when you're responding to such a sharp economic crisis as we saw in 2020, they need to be coordinated. Now, your question around do I have confidence in the central bank decision making process? We have a lot of very, very clever people sit in central banks around the world. So it's not so much a question of confidence in the decision making process or not. But I think we need to have a, a degree of confidence that that combination of the fiscal response and the monetary response bear equal part of the load of building through this recovery. What we did get, and I think the the speed of the response that we saw in March from central banks around the world was one of the great positives, because unlike after the financial crisis, it really took quite a long time to get that coordination. This time it was really fast.
I think they, they did an awful lot that was right in 2020 and should absolutely be commended from that. They can't solve this process, this problem in isolation. It does need a coordinated fiscal response. And governments have done a degree of that. I'm not sure that mm -hmm. we've quite got through to the end of what will need to be done as we, as we really see what the, the, you know, the scarring is like of the, of the global economy in, in 2021. Right. My final question, and we have seen so much uh, from the year 2020 and even leading to the very beginning of 2021. Uh, for example, what happening at the Capitol uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, some say uh, as the largest economy, it has becoming such an unpredictable factor. Uh, as an investor, as someone who's been doing your trade for long, what do you make of these unpredictabilities, particularly from the largest economy in the world? Unpredictability, um, I've, I've never really figured out when this Halcyon period was where um, politics and economies were very predictable. They've always felt pretty unpredictable to me as we've yeah. gone through. And there, there, there are shifting sands around the world. I absolutely uh, understand that. And I don't want to diminish the importance of that. But nonetheless, we have seen, I think, at, a, at an individual company level, at an individual industry level, things that really make a difference that, that we're, are worth focusing on. And one of the clear things that have helped us guide us through 2020 has been that focus at an individual company level on sustainability. Those are the companies that have done better. And I think that is going to be continuing a, a trend into 2021. We will continue to see, and we should continue to focus on those companies that are really trying to deliver against that sustainability agenda because I think those are the ones that are going to do better over time. They are more resilient and that's how we try and navigate the unpredictability. And Richards, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and all the best. Be safe. Thank you and to you too, be safe. Thank you very much. Lovely to chat to you. And Richards from Fidelity International. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, search us World Insight or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Ken Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for watching and bye.